This is a 1991 Mercedes-Benz 300 SL. And the crazy thing is it has a manual transmission. For the last 20 plus years, we've thought of the Mercedes SL as a comfortable luxury cruiser with an automatic and a lot of pampering luxurious features, an old man cruiser, but they used to make them with three pedals. And this is the last version of the SL ever offered with a manual. Today, I'm going to review it and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, big news, this 300 SL is currently for sale being auctioned live on cars and bids. This 300 SL has that manual transmission and the factory hardtop in addition to the convertible soft top and some good recent servicing and it's offered with no reserve. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description to head over to cars and bids for the live auction for this 300 SL where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of this car by first giving a general overview of this Mercedes-Benz SL and what makes this one so special. So this version of the SL is referred to as the R129 model. That was the chassis code for this car, and it's the fourth generation of Mercedes SL. Everybody knows the first generation is the famous Gullwing. Well, this is the fourth gen model. It was sold from 1990 all the way to 2002. And this 1991 model is obviously a pretty early car. Now, given this SL's long production run, as you can imagine, some changes and improvements went into this car over the span of its production run. And as a result, later versions of this SL are considered to be better. They're the ones that people want. In fact, I reviewed a very late production R129 a couple of years ago, amazing car. Everybody prefers the later cars with one exception. From 1990 to 1993, Mercedes-Benz offered this SL with a manual transmission. Only four model years you could get the manual right at the start of production, and this car has it. And of course, as you can imagine, it is tremendously rare. Only four years, and apparently in the 1991 model year, Mercedes only sold 240 of these total with the manual. So you figure a couple other years, and it probably lost popularity as it went on. So maybe there's only a few hundred manual SLs originally built, let alone those that have survived. It's incredibly uncommon. Now, unfortunately, the drawback is just as you might expect. Like in a lot of other cars, Mercedes-Benz only offered the manual transmission in the base model with the base engine, only in the 300 SL. You could never get the manual with a V8 or a V12 in this car, but it wasn't really so bad. The 300 SL, this car used a three liter six cylinder with about 230 horsepower. Not a massive number, but this SL is also a lot smaller and lighter and less complex than modern cars, and so it didn't need that much power. Plus, it had a manual transmission. Now, you might be wondering why Mercedes offered the SL with a stick shift. It seems so far from anything we could imagine the SL being today, but it was really this version of the SL where it really started to make the transition from a somewhat sporty car to a luxury cruiser. Mercedes dropped the manual on this car after the 93 model year, and they added a V12 instead. They took the whole car more upmarket, more luxury, focused, more expensive, which kind of turned it into the old people cruiser that we know today. Now, it's worth pointing out that this was not the last Mercedes-Benz offered with a manual transmission. In fact, Mercedes continued to offer three pedals in the C-Class and the SLK for many more years, but even that ended a long time ago, and the concept of a relatively modern Mercedes-Benz with a manual transmission is still a surprise, but this car had it. 
By the way, one interesting quirk while I'm up here, in the engine bay, you can see there is just so much room left over by this six-cylinder engine. Mercedes clearly designed this car with a V8 in mind, and probably even they were considering that a V12 may go in it later. The three-liter six-cylinder was clearly not intended to take up this car's entire engine bay. It was clearly not the top offering, and that's made very clear when you pop the hood. But anyway, next up, let's move on to the rest of this SL's quirks and features, and as you can imagine, there are quite a few, as this is a flagship luxury model from 30 years ago. Starting with the weird lock and unlock process. This car came from before the days of keyless entry, so you had to walk up to the car and manually unlock it with a key, and when you do that, a green light flashes to let you know that you've just unlocked the car. You can see it there on the door handle, flashing to let you know the doors are unlocked. If you want to lock the doors, you twist the key the other way, and then a red light flashes to let you know that you've just locked the doors. And it does this over on the passenger side as well. Lock and unlock with these different colored lights to let you know, sort of a predecessor to the turn signal flash that modern cars do when you lock or unlock them. Now, when you climb inside to the SL, you're also confronted by an interesting situation with the locks. This is the door lock switch, and you operate it almost like cocking a gun. You push it down, and then the doors are locked, and that locks both doors, driver and passenger. Now, interestingly, you cannot unlock the doors using that switch. Instead, the switch is connected to the door handle, and the only way to unlock them is to pull on the door handle. That opens the door and unlocks the doors simultaneously. Certainly an odd system, but that's what they did. And speaking of interesting locks on this door panel, this armrest isn't just an armrest. In fact, it's a lid that lifts up. You can lift it up, and then you can put storage storage in the door pocket, and the weird thing here is this storage compartment locks with the doors. When you lock the doors, you can see this little pin here would also lock along with the doors in order to lock this storage compartment closed. Lockable door panel storage, not something you see very often, but there's a reason that they did it. This SL does not have a glove box. You can see over on the passenger side of the dashboard, it has an airbag instead. This was one of the first cars to have dual airbags, and back then, you kind of had to choose between an airbag or a glove box. They didn't really have space to do both. They didn't know how to integrate both, so this car didn't have a glove box, and it had those lockable door panels instead. It also had a lockable center console. You can lift the center console up and put stuff in it, and then you can lock it. Since this car has no glove box, they thought of other lockable storage solutions on the interior where you could put stuff that you might normally keep in your glove box. Now, beyond this storage stuff, a couple of other interesting storage items in this interior. One, in the center console, you have this roll-top lid. You can roll it back and reveal a rather large storage area in there with a somewhat intricate cup holder. You push on this little tab, and then the cup holder unfolds itself, so you have a spot for your drinks. German cars in this era, not common to see cup holders, but a flagship luxury model like this, it makes sense. Now, the other interesting storage compartment is accessed with the push of this button in the center with an arrow pointing up. You press that, and then this lid can be lifted up, and there's a little bit of storage in there, but that was really not useful to anyone. The reason they had that is for cars that were equipped with the car phone. You had some car phone controls in this little compartment, but if you didn't have the car phone, you got a little bit of extra storage, I guess. Not that there was anything you could really put in there. Maybe a few pens. Now, beyond all of this stuff, there are quite a few unusual controls in this car. As you might expect, it's an older luxury car. They had some different ideas 30 years ago. One good example is this switch here, which shows like an image of something and then an arrow. That puts up the roll bar. If you press it, you can see the roll bar behind the seats actually goes upwards and then locks into place. Or you could press it the other direction and then the roll bar goes down and also locks into place, but now down. The reason they did this is, well, for safety. You could drive around with the roll bar down and it looked cooler. The car just looks better with the full convertible top, sort of this roadster look, but if you wanted more safety and support in case of a rollover, you could put up the roll bar. So if you thought you were going to do some crazy high-performance driving, maybe put the roll bar up in case you roll over. Otherwise, put it down and look cool. It was lovely that they made you choose between safety 
and style. And speaking of things that go up in this car, as you can imagine, the roof also goes up. It's a fully automated power top, which is pretty impressive for a car from the early 1990s. And it was controlled with this switch here, which is actually in the shape of a top. Mercedes did this on all their convertibles in this era, and I have always loved how this switch looked. You can see the back window, the side window. So it was pretty clear which direction you had to press it to make it go up or down. You push it forward to put the top up and you can see the top in motion doing its thing. Now, one interesting thing about the top in this car is the operation is rather loud. This is how it came from the factory. A power top was a new thing and they didn't know how to make everything seamless and quiet. And so there are some noises from hydraulics with stuff locking and clicking and snapping into place. Take a listen to the top going down. Anyway, beyond the roof and the roll bar, there are many other unusual controls in this car. For example, the climate vents. In your car, you have a little slider under each climate vent to position what direction it's blowing. In this car, all of the sliders were in the center, even for the climate vents on the side. You'd think it would be way easier to just put the slider directly under the corresponding climate vent, but that's not what they did. You adjusted it all in the middle, even for the side vent. And how about this? There's a lumbar support control on the side of the seat. It's a little wheel dial, but instead of having numbers, one, two, three, four, five, it has lowercase letters, A through E. And most interesting, C is the normal default setting. So C in the middle, like a piece of music in middle C on a piano, that is the lumbar support instead of one through five, like every other car would have had. Also a little unusual in this car is the climate controls, which you can see here. A couple strange things for one, it was clear they wanted you to use the automatic mode because that button is about four times the size of any other button on this panel. They really wanted you to do that. Also weird is how you turn it off. There's not an off button or a dial. You just turn all the way down. Instead, a button marked zero. In other words, you want zero climate control. You press that and that was the off button. In this car, even the manual transmission is weird. The famed R129 SL manual, two odd things. Number one, it had a foot mounted parking brake, meaning you have four pedals in this car, the accelerator, the brake, the clutch, and the parking brake. And you didn't want to accidentally press the parking brake when you were going for the clutch. That would have been catastrophic. The other weird thing about this manual, it's a dog leg. And that means that first is down and to the left instead of up and to the left, like in basically every other car. It also means your one, two upshift requires you to go up and to the right to get into second and reverse is located up and to the left where first gear is in virtually every other car. Now, fortunately, you won't accidentally go into reverse when you're going for first because you have to lift the gear lever up. That's the lockout to get it into reverse, but it's still an unusual pattern, a dog leg gear lever. Now, other Mercedes Benz models from this era also had the dog leg. I drove a 190E 2.316 that had the same pattern. And there were other cars that did this too. The F40 and other Ferraris had a dog leg. There was some theory behind it, including that the 2-3 upshift, which is more important when you're doing performance driving than 1-2, that was directly in a line. And so that was a reason why some did the dog leg. But pretty much everybody eventually abandoned it. And so driving it is a little disconcerting today. The gears are in a different place than you might expect. By the way, one other interesting quirk in this interior is the warning chime situation. Mercedes-Benz models from this era had the worst warning chimes of any vehicle. You leave the lights on and this is what you get. Admittedly, you will never leave the lights on with that warning chime, but you are assaulted in your ears by how awful it is. That was the chimes in a lot of these 90s Mercedes.
Now, one other interesting item worth noting in the interior, this car doesn't have back seats. In fact, the vast majority of SL models weren't offered with back seats, and this car continued that trend, although you do have a space back here where you can put stuff, storage, small bags, that adds to the practicality of this interior. And of course, if you run out of space up there, you can also use the trunk. Nothing particularly unusual about this trunk, but it's here, and it's got storage space if you want to put stuff in it. Also worth pointing out, in the trunk of this particular SL, I have discovered the original maintenance booklet that comes with these cars, and you were supposed to like stamp it or get it ripped off at the dealer every time you did maintenance, and you can see this car had a lot of these stamps. It's cool to see all these in-period services that were documented for this car. Now, the only really interesting or unusual thing about the trunk is how you open it. There's no trunk latch like in modern cars. Cars in this era generally didn't have that. Instead, to open the trunk, you had to use the key. You would walk up to the back of the car, this keyhole here, stick the key in, push it, and then the trunk would unlatch and you could open it. Now, the unusual thing about this trunk procedure is that this keyhole has more functions than just that. If you walked up, stuck the key in it, and twisted, you could lock the trunk and all the doors. It served as an extra exterior door lock, and you can see the little red light flashing to let you know that all the doors are locked just like I showed you before on the door handle. And of course, you can do it the other way and unlock all the doors from the trunk as well. So you had basically an extra lock and unlock position in the back of the car. Now, one other interesting thing worth pointing out about this car is the name, 300 SL, just like the Gullwing. One interesting thing about Mercedes-Benz models from this era and from earlier is that Mercedes used to lead its model names with the number, and then the letters came after that. The number referred to the engine size. In this case, 300 is a three-liter six-cylinder, and of course, SL was the model. But this got to be a little confusing, because Mercedes would have a bunch of cars that had 300 as the first part of their name, even though they were totally unrelated. One would be a large sedan and the 300 SEL, then another would be a convertible, the 300 SL, and then there would be another sedan, the 300 E, and it didn't really make sense why they were all the 300. So for the 1994 model year, Mercedes-Benz flipped things. The 500 SL became the SL 500. The 300 SL also got a larger engine and became the SL 320. The 400 E became the E 420, etc., etc. The letters came first, the numbers came later, and this continues to this day. And it was the 94 model year where that change was made. And that's one of the ways you can tell that this car is pre-94. And next up, we move back up to the front of this SL, where there are a couple of interesting quirks, starting with the headlight wipers. You can see this car has little wipers, like windshield wipers, on its headlights, which was a very unusual decision. But back in this era, Mercedes-Benz was experimenting with a lot of new stuff, and some of it would stick, like dual airbags, and some of it wouldn't, like headlight wipers. The way these worked was you were driving along at night with the headlights on, and if you had your regular windshield wiper on, the headlight wipers would wipe like every minute or every 30 seconds or some amount of time. It wasn't just this car that had them. Some other Mercedes-Benz models had them. A few Volvos did too, and maybe some other cars, but obviously they didn't catch on, and they're not around today. But headlight wipers were an idea. Mercedes was kicking around around in this era. Now, one interesting thing is the actual windshield only has one wiper. The giant mono wiper wipes the windshield pretty well, goes across the entire thing, but just one for the whole windshield and two for the headlights. Another interesting thing up front in this car is the way the hood release comes out. To unlatch the hood, you go into the driver footwell and pull on this latch like basically every other car, but then the release itself comes out of the bottom of the Mercedes-Benz Star. Pretty clever positioning. You reach in there, pull the hood latch, unlatch it, and then you can open it up from there. A couple other interesting points with this car. For one thing, the two-tone paint job. You can see that this car is kind of a dark gray on top and a light gray on the bottom. Only 
of the early R129 SL models had the two-tone paint job, but a lot of cars had more contrasting colors than this. They would be like red on the top and gray on the bottom or green or blue on the top. But this car is more subdued. Mercedes-Benz went with a single color for later SL models. Also worth pointing out, even though this car is a soft top convertible, it came from the factory with a body colored hard top. This car still has its body colored hard top, but getting it on is kind of a chore. It's a multi-person job. You got to lift it into perfect place and then you could drive around in the hard top. Mercedes didn't intend for you to do this very frequently. Maybe only twice a year you would take the hard top off in the spring as it got warm and you would maybe put it back on in the fall as it cooled down again and you would just store it otherwise because it was kind of a pain. Now interestingly, Mercedes-Benz offered to SL owners of this era a system that you could mount on the ceiling of your garage and it would keep the hard top in place. And then if you wanted to put the hard top on your car, you would drive right under the ceiling mounted hard top holder and you could easily lower it onto your car to make that process easier. When you were done, you could use the system to raise it back up off your car and keep it positioned directly above your car on your garage ceiling. I have to imagine all of these systems are now gone as these cars have gotten older, people have sold them, they've uninstalled those systems from their garage, but they existed at the time, a way to get the hardtop on your car more easily. Now, of course, the SL model after this, which came out in 2003, had a power retractable hardtop, which solved that problem entirely because you got both a convertible and a hardtop without any unnecessary and annoying manual hardtop. All right, I'm driving a manual R129 SL. It is so weird to me to look down at this steering wheel and this dashboard and have three pedals. Um, this is the same steering wheel and a lot of the same controls I have in my G-Wagon, which is obviously an automatic, but I've also reviewed a ton of late 80s and early 90s Mercedes-Benz models, all of which are always automatics. And here I am driving one with three, it just like doesn't compute. I'm like doing something with my feet and my hands that my brain doesn't understand. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. So let's talk, I mean, obviously the thing that everybody's gonna be interested in is the manual transmission and the driving experience and how that changes it. A lot of people out there have driven R129 SLs or have been around them. Your uncle had one or a neighbor had one or whatever, but no one's ever seen a stick shift one. So what's that like? The answer is it drives like how a Mercedes Benz would make a manual transmission, which is to say, it's like top quality. Like the clutch is smooth and not stiff, but it provides good feedback, but there's no like kink. It's not annoying, but it's also not like this quick shifting thing. Like it's a long travel, like an, you'd expect from maybe an old school vehicle with three pedals. The shifter itself, again, good quality, but also again, not exactly the sportiest thing. Um, like you move it into gear and it does what it needs to do, but it's not like a short shifter with like really tight gates or anything like that. Like it feels, it feels like an old school manual transmission. The interesting thing is driving a car that feels like a early 90s Mercedes Benz that has three pedals because these cars are known for sort of a feeling of weight and of heaviness. Everybody calls them bank vault cars. It, it does, they, they always felt like that and this one does too. Everything is very well built. Nothing creaks, nothing rattles. Everything is, you know, so steering is heavy. The feel of the car is heavy and driving that with a manual transmission just doesn't seem to make all that much sense. Like this car shouldn't have three pedals. But the cool thing about this car and the thing that I love is it adds an excitement factor to this SL that other ones don't really have. Yes, it is the least powerful engine, but it's 230 horsepower and you got a manual to liven things up a bit. And I think that the, the thing that everybody loves about these SLs is like the way they look, the way they feel, this era of Mercedes Benz before quality kind of took a dive in the late 90s, early 2000s. But then people can't really square up with the fact that it's also kind kind of a dull car to drive. The SL500, the SL600, they're not, they were cruisers. But here's a car that gives you kind of the best of all worlds. It brings the SL's look and feel in with a manual, which definitely does enhance like the feel and the driving experience. Now, one interesting thing, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of low power in this car. First gear doesn't feel like you get going and there's no like bouncing off the line. It's sort of a slow pull off the line, like you might expect from a Mercedes Benz from this era. It just kind of brings all of the usual Mercedes stuff, except now it has three pedals.
Okay, that's fourth. I'm looking down because now it's weird. I, I can drive a dog leg. I've driven a bunch and it's not that weird for me, but getting into the higher gears is where I'm like, all right, am I in fifth? Am I in fourth? I don't really get it. I don't want to say that this car is like lively and super fun and thrilling because I, that's not how I would put it. But I don't think that people who are buying this car are necessarily thinking that's what they're going to get. I think that they're thinking, hey, it's it's a Mercedes from this era, it's a cruiser car, that's what these are for, but it has a manual which makes things more fun, and, and it certainly does. It is interesting, even when you floor it in this car and get all the way to the top of the red line, it never loses its Mercedesness. It never feels like fast and like, let's go have some fun. It never feels too loud, it never feels too frenetic. It still feels like the Mercedes Benz that it is and I think that that's so interesting even when Mercedes makes a manual two-door roadster and it still feels like a Mercedes Benz like a sturdy well-constructed car first and foremost and maybe you can have some fun on the fringes later and so that's a 1991 Mercedes Benz 300 SL with a manual transmission it's weird to drive any manual Mercedes but especially an SL it just doesn't feel right, but it exists and you can buy it on cars and bids. Anyway, now it's time to give this manual SL a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 46 out of 100, which places the 300 SL manual pretty predictably in this spot against some sort of similar cars. Obviously, the manual 300 SL doesn't beat out contemporaries like the FD Mazda RX-7 or the original Dodge Viper, but it easily beats the car I've reviewed that's the closest competitor, the 1988 Jaguar XJS. The manual 300 SL was a quirky version of a very desirable car, and I'm glad I got to check out one of the rare few in existence. 